Uh, I'm going to give you a short talk on how the internet can change South African society. Um, I don't think that I'm going to tell you anything that's particularly con uh, controversial. Um, and indeed, quite a lot of what I'm going to say, most of you will know. Um, but it, hopefully this will set the tone for the, for the balance of the, of, of, the com of the conference and we can have a discussion around that. Um, <coughs> First of all, I need to give you an apology. Our chairman, uh, Dr. Stephen Ngobi, was intended to give this presentation. Unfortunately, our political masters called him to Cape Town, <coughs> and uh, I've been given the task, so I trust I will meet your approval. The agenda is as follows. <coughs> First of all, I'm going to talk about a little bit about ACASA itself, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that the internet, w some of the ways that the internet can change society, providing, including free and open access to inf information, um, freedom of association, freedom of trade, what, what it means for education, entertainment, universal service, and I'll close off with a couple of words about future trends. Um, in terms of ACASA's mandate, <coughs> um, we have a, a vision. Okay, the, the, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa has the vision to advance the building of a digital society. And our mission is to ensure that all South Africans have access to a wide range of high-quality communication services at affordable prices. Those all that all sounds very well, and everybody's got a vision and a mission, but it doesn't mean anything unless you do something about it. So in order to start doing something about it, we've put together eight strategic objectives. Um, <coughs> and they're listed here uh, in no particular order. First of all, we have uh, effective participation by historically disadvantaged individuals in the industry. And I see that we still, 10 years later, are mostly pale male, but not as much as we were. Um, <coughs> broadband is important. We need to ensure that we get as much of that as possible. We need to sort out the spectrum um, issues and get that used as much as possible. We need to protect the consumer, including those with disabilities. We need to promote uh, the development of various kinds of broadcasting and get on with the digital migration, which is, I'm sure you're all aware, starts in April next year and finishes in December 2013. We need to play the big policeman and make sure that people comply with the legislation and regulation. We need to strengthen and modernize ICASA, and therein lies a tale. Um, in order to be able to do our job properly, we have to have all the, the, t the skills and the tools and the equipment and the people to do that. So that's where we're putting quite a lot of our attention there to, to, to sort that out. And finally, we need to promote competition because that is one of the best ways of, uh, uh, of um, improving uh, both quality and price to the consumer, as well as the range of products. And <coughs> we, ICASA has had some successes. Um, and we, whilst we can't claim all the credit for everything, I just want to share a couple of them with you. Um, on the screen now, you can see what's happened to mobile data rates. I'm sure most of you know that there was a lot of noise um, last year and the year before about mobile interconnection rates. It's the wholesale rates that the various mobile operators were paying each other. Um, and the process actually started in 2008 when Acasa was started doing a market review. Um, where we asked the operators hard questions about exactly what, they were, what their numbers were, what their costs were, um, and we built, uh, or to be more accurate, we paid a consultant to build a <coughs> cost model of, for each of, the, for each of the, uh, uh, the mobile operators and the fixed line operators. Um, and we went through with a process that culminated in the uh, uh, some p passing of some regulations last year um, that meant that in, as of March this year, we had a reduction in the rates that these various operators were charging each other, the wholesale rates. In the meantime, there was a moral suasion process that also happened under the, then mini under the ambit of the then minister, which, which uh, uh, led to an increase in March last year a decrease in, in wholesale rates la March last year. Remember, these are wholesale rates, these are not retail rates. There's no direct correlation between the two. Nevertheless, the high visibility of this issue in, in, in terms of, of, the, um, of the press and uh, the fact that people are paying a lot of attention to it, plus the two reductions, one in 2010 and one in 2011, uh, have indeed led to some reductions in, in um, in retail rates, and you can see that these are quite significant. They are, in fact, about half. Interestingly, ATO chose to increase their, their uh, peak rates, although their off-peak rates remain the cheapest. Uh, and all the operators reduced other benefits that are not shown on here, such as, for example, fee minutes. 
So we've had a specific and, uh, 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 and measurable um, reduction in terms of, of uh, mobile interconnection rates, mobile retail rates, um, and that w that's set to continue for the next, ne next ne the balance of the three years when we have two more, two more reductions in the interconnection rates when we en end up with the mobile rates at f 40 cents um, and the fixed rate at 19 cents. Um, that will also remove the uh, differentiation between peak and off-peak periods. And after that, we'll think again. Other costs have also changed. As you can see here, uh, s the CPI has gone steadily up, um, much less than the last couple of years that it has in previous years, and so is the food price prices, and they don't quite track each other, which is of interest. But the blue line is the telecommunications prices, and you can see that's more or less halved during the three years in, the, in, this, in this graph. And in fact, we have a 27% reduction in retail prices in the first five months of this year. And these figures come from Stats SA. Um, so we've had some improvements in terms of telecommunication from the point of view of the, of the general public. Uh, as I said, ICASA can, can't claim all the credit for this by any means, but we can claim a little bit of it. Now, to the main agenda. In terms of free and open access to information, this is, of course, one of the most obvious things one get, gets out of the, in, the Internet. And it's a powerful agency for freedom and self-determination. It lets you do what you want to do <coughs> in the way you want to do. It allows you to teach yourself about stuff. I spend at least an hour every day, and sometimes more than that, um, sometimes a lot more than that, learning stuff. I'm 53 years old, and I'm still learning, and I continue to intend to continue learning for quite a long time since. It allows you to achieve, <coughs> uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy uh, of needs, it allows you to do self-actualizations in, insofar as you can do the things that you want to do, you can feel the way you want to feel about things. Uh, and in particular, it provides the freedom of speech. The internet allows everyone to publish. But of course, that means that everyone does. And don't believe everything that you read, because some of it's absolute drivel, and some of it's positively dangerous. Uh, <coughs> but one, there is the assumption that you have at least three brain cells to rub together, and you can distinguish between the two. So the, all of those things lead to independent, well-informed, and well-rounded in, in individuals who know what they want. Now, that is one of the things that internet leads to. It's not always what um, uh, 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 everyone wants, um, particularly not for the general populace, but I th in, in my personal view, that's a good thing. Um, next, we've got freedom of association. The internet allows you to talk to people, um, people that you're not necessarily standing in the same room with, um, and you can talk up to lots of different people online who have similar views on any one subject. Um, and because it's so easy to associate with people, and uh, the social networking uh, um, is an obvious example of that, Facebook groups, uh, um, uh, uh, LinkedIn, and so on, um, you can, <coughs> mailing lists, fora, my broadband is another example, you can meet with people online, you can chat to them, you can have, uh, have conversations with them, and you may even occasionally, at a place like I, we get to meet them face to face. Um, so you can be a member of many unrelated groups, each with a different area of interest. And so we can say that the internet strengthens and deepens our democracy. And indeed, Bill Gates said exactly that some time ago. He said, few benefits of online interactivity of such potential impor importance are so often overlooked as the internet's promise for improving democracy. In this country, I think we need to have fully online government, including local government, before we can take advantage of that. And we'll come to some of the issues that we need to address in that a little later on. OK, now let's move on to freedom of trade. I'm sure this is almost everybody here knows this. Um, conducting business over the internet benefits both the buyer and the seller. For the buyer, you can compare prices, specifications, and other factors from the comfort of your, of your own home. So it allows you to choose the best product to suit your need, rather than what your local shop has in stock at the time of visit. Uh, <coughs> last night, I had a problem with my brake pipe. I went to the local late night spare part, and the only part he was <coughs> out of stock of was the one I needed. <laughs> got all the others. Um, the, the customer has a choice of delivery mechanism. You can go fetch it yourself. You can get someone to deliver it to you. You can pay online. You can do your banking online, of course. And you can even complain online. And in some cases, you get a live response. I think the Americans so far are better at that, at that than we are, but we are, we are beginning to learn to do that. <coughs> in terms of the, the seller, the small entrepreneur can, can compete on equal footing with large and established companies. In fact, sometimes <coughs> if you look at, you compare the, uh, a website and an e-commerce site from a smaller operator and a bigger operator, and the big guy spent 20 million rand, 
And the small guy, huh, he spent a couple hundred thousand on his, his website, wipes the, wipe, wipes the slate with the other one. But a virtual presence can significantly reduce the cost compared to a brick and mortar shop, and new models of business become possible, such as internet banking, online ticket sales, social networks, online shopping, and online advertising. And the example of that, of course, is Google, which is one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, they, I think they're third place at the moment in the US. What do they sell? They do not sell search. They sell online advertising. They're very, very good at it. Other things that one used to do face-to-face -face or over the telephone have become faster and easier and cheaper. And self-service for the consumer becomes a reality in many ways. And another example, online insurers save about 50% of their costs by becoming fully online. That's a significant margin. No large offices, no call centers, no agents, no commissions, much more to the point. Customers are self-selecting and only compete and not only complete all their details themselves online, but they can update and correct their details as required later again online. <coughs> and you can reach the customers across international borders, you can reach the service customers at all, at all hours. So from the point of view of the seller, um, the internet is a wonderful thing. And in developing countries such as China, a 10% increase in broadband penetration translates into as much as a 2.5% increase in GDP. And from the same source, which is the Broadband Commission Report Number 2 this year, that's an ITU, UNESCO um, uh, creature, the figure for a 10% increase in broadband penetration translates to one point, just under 1.4% increase in GDP. Considering that we need 6 to 8% uh, growth in South Africa in order to be able to deal with our, our unemployment problems, this is a significant issue. I don't think there's any one thing that can contribute as much to uh, GDP growth as that figure of 1.38%. Education. And this is probably a cliche. <coughs> uh, the internet allows students to study online. There are numerous interactive courses offered by institutions allowing students to study at their own pace to the comfort of their own homes. An example is Moodle. Any, who knows about Moodle? Getting there, okay. There are 37 million users. My daughter is one of them. <coughs> Her school does it. There are 57,000 sites, 50,000 sites in the world. With luck, Icasa will become one of them soon. Um, it's an open source solution to putting up your own online training system. It works. <coughs> students have access, via the internet, students have access to previous papers in preparation for their exams, enabling them to learn from the past and prepare for the future. <coughs> the internet is almost, but not quite, replaced encyclopedias and provides a library of worldwide information. But there are some provisos. Some discernment is needed to distinguish between reliable sources and utter twaddle. And the, failure the internet does not compensate for our school's failure to teach basic functional literacy and numeracy. It's very hard to learn something on the internet unless you can read enough to get to the right place to get there. So the internet assists South African citizens in becoming properly educated. It's not insufficient of itself, but it's certainly of a great help. So if we move on to entertainment, much more fun stuff. The internet, inter internet makes existing forms of entertainment easier, cheaper, and more convenient. And examples of video on demand, like Netflix in the US, BBC's iPlayer in this country, and I'm dead sure that there are some people in this, in this room who, if they're not doing it already in South Africa, are planning to do video on demand. Video. <coughs> um, video on demand is different to IPTV in terms of ICASA's viewpoint. IPTV is broadcasting, video on demand is not. You do not require a broadcasting license for video on demand. And new forms of entertainment become possible, such as massive multiplayer role playing games. An example is Farmville or town, Farm Town on Facebook, and I'm not sure which is which, but they have both. Um, and streaming video and these other things as well, uh, like the, 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 the uh, <coughs> various role playing games and first person shoot them up for games for that matter, require high bandwidth capacity networks, which drives infrastructure investment, which drives down prices. So games are not just uh, 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 trivial, and entertainment's not just trivial. It's a significant factor in, t in terms of, um, in terms of uh, 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 the, the, the whole investment model. And in fact, uh, in terms of Cis in, in Cisco's um, uh, Cisco, Cisco's predictions uh, and measurements, uh, video is, is, is now approaching 50, uh, by 2015 will be 50% of total internet bandwidth on mobile. So entertainment gives you more fun for less money. Okay, so let's look at universal service briefly. 
we really actually already have near universal service population coverage in South Africa. It's not quite the same thing as universal service. We have population coverage with about 97% of the population having access to at least GSM uh, three, uh, edge connectivity. So you've got sort of 1G, 2G stuff there. It's not broadband, but it is a start. You can use the internet, and I've done it. <coughs> the problem is not, so, from that point of view, the problem is not so much a digital divide as an affordability gap. And with uh, only 41% of our um, adult population employed, um, affordability is a major issue. But as the cost of connectivity comes down, it will become more affordable as a proportion of income. Currently, uh, instant access, in fact, all telecommunications is a significant uh, proportion of income compared to, uh, in South Africa, compared to, for example, to developed countries where it's a fraction of a percent. Here we're talking about, if I remember correctly, around about 5%. As more people use the internet, the desirability of uh, becoming connected increases. Hey, my buddy's on Facebook, I want to be on Facebook too. So the proportion of income people are prepared to spend also increases. So we have costs coming down and we have the amount of people, money people are prepared to spend going up. So that affordability gap does gradually close. But government's 100% broadband penetration by 2020 target does remain tough to reach. And there are, we're going to, all of us, both the regulator and the industry <coughs> and the policy maker are going to have to work together to get there. Oops. So, in terms of universal service, we are approaching the point, we've got a long way to go, but we're approaching the point where more people are connected, communicating, interacting, and transacting via the internet, and that's happening all the time. Um, <coughs> so, now we're on the last chapter. Let's talk about future trends very briefly. Rural data usage, as reported by one large operator, mobile operator in one large African country, is doubling every six months. That's people using GPRS and Edge. That's using the, the slower stuff, but it's doubling every six months. That's significant. And for 2G, about 60% of all traffic is data. And for 3G, about 90%, most of it, all traffic is data. This is mobile traffic, hey? And by 2015, the Middle East and Africa will have the strongest mobile data growth, uh, traffic growth at any region in the world at 130% compound annual growth. And that's from Cisco. <coughs> um, and costs are coming down significantly both in the fixed and mobile world, especially international traffic due to many undersea cables. Of course, we still have problems in terms of the cost of national connectivity um, and the more local connectivity, urban and metro and last mile, but we're getting there too. And a whole lot of people are laying fiber. Um, they're laying metro, including especially metro fiber, national and last mile fiber. There are some people laying uh, last mile fiber, and some of the some people, in, including some people who are have an open access model, which is being implemented by several players in the country. Um, speaking of open access, um, as most of you probably know, the local loop unbundling process is underway. Uh, I can't say anything more about it than that, other than to invite you to the public hearings, which are from the 10th to the 14th of October. You're welcome to come and come and have a listen. Uh, we will probably be able to offer you a cup of tea or something. And ICASA is, in, in the context of, of, of this, ICASA is mindful of its strategic objectives. In particular, strategic objective two, which refers to broadband, um, strategic objective three, which refers to spectrum, and eight, which refers to competition. And of course, to make all that happen, we've got to deal with ourselves, uh, number seven. Thank you. Please contact me if you have any questions. But thank you, sir. William, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Um, are we allowed to ask you questions? Yes. If I can't answer them, I won't answer them. <laughs> um, we've got some roaming mics. If anybody wants to ask a particular question to William regarding Masses at Casa, there's a question in the back there. What? <coughs> Hi, um, Barry here from Business Connection. Um, just a quick question in terms of freedom of speech. There's a new clampdown on the media. Is a cost going to become a, a watchdog on, on ISPs on what our customers publish or what comes through our networks in regards to that? ICASA does not regulate content except insofar as it specifies for the broadcasting industry the proportion of content of one type or another, such as local or educational or so on, and news. We don't deal with the 
what people actually say from a spe freedom of speech point of view at all. Not our job. I'm delighted to say. <laughs> Morning, it's uh, Sammy Marfa from Broadband Infoco. Uh, you said the, the government has a target of 100% broadband penetration by 2020. Yes. Um, which agency is managing that and uh, is that being, uh, uh, how is being tracked in that? Uh, that comes from a, a wor two-day workshop held between the Department of Communications and industry members um, in a th earlier this year, um, and uh, the the participants at that workshop committed themselves to to uh, achieving that target. Um, so the short answer to your question is the Department of Communications. Um, it also does match, match with um, the overall government develop, uh, development goals where the, the connectivity stuff basically falls under um, outcome six, outputs five and two and five. Uh, we've got one Hi question there. in the middle there. Um, in terms of pushing new technologies and that kind of stuff, what is ECASA doing towards promoting IPv6 and helping IPv6 forward in the country? Good question. What would you like us to do? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear the reply. No. The short answer is as of this very moment, nothing. Okay? <coughs> the longer answer is that it it, we do recognize that it is something that we do need to address and it is on our list of jobs to do. Okay. Over here. Me? Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is ECASA or the industry making any input to the National Planning Commission? I've read through their overview, their diagnostics, and I haven't come across anything about, I might have not read it properly, but I got the whole document, obviously, and I haven't seen any input from uh, the IT industry. Is it, is it, is it going to be there, or am I misreading what the National Planning Commission is doing? John, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, I'm a councillor, which means I'm a director of the, of the organisation. It means I do not deal with the day-to-day -day business of what it costs up to. I am continually surprised by things that people are doing that I didn't realise they were doing. And I, but I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, hi, William. Uh, following on from Graham's question about IPv6, uh, does the CASA have any plans to change or amend the type approval process to ensure that only uh, internet devices that are IPv6 ready get type approval? I cannot answer that question from my own knowledge, but it's certainly a good, good, a good suggestion. Thank you. William, Anthony here from Gyro Technologies. Um, mine's actually two questions. One is obviously Spectrum. And uh, obviously we're reading too much iWeek and not iWeek, it's um, the IT web and that lately. And uh, we'd love to know what ECOS is busy doing about the whole spec uh, Spectrum auctioning. And then the other comment um, is as far as broadband being reclassified potentially as five megabit per second, how is that going to be achievable in the rural areas and how does ECOS see that if there's any comment? So just say your last little bit there again. Um, the Department of Communications wants to reclassify uh, broadband as five megabit per second. And obviously uh, by 2020 having um, broadband penetration in the rural areas. How does uh, ECASA react to that? Okay, the first question about spectrum. Currently we're waiting for, we are expecting a policy directive from the minister. Okay. Um, so whilst, whilst we are carrying on with, with um, work on, on the issue of, of spectrum, in particular the issuance of, of, of the high demand spectrum, we won't finalise anything on that until we've had an opportunity to, to uh, provide the, uh, to, to get the direct directive from the Minister. And we are engaging with the, de the department um, uh, around, around that and we have commented on that draft directive so already. In terms of the second half of it, um, the universal service, the, 
The cost, well, I have no problem with broadband being defined as 5 megabits per second in principle. The reality, though, um, is, is the, or the practicality is can this be, prov be provided at an economical cost? Um, it's a truism <coughs> that when you are achieve, trying to achieve something, and you particularly when you're trying to achieve something like coverage, where the, um, the, urban, the dense urban users in high-rise blocks of flats are really cheap to wire up physically, for example, if you're talking about fixed-line connectivity, or for that matter, if you're talking about wireless connectivity, they're relatively cheap to do. Um, and then uh, the, the, the suburban areas are still cheap, but not quite as cheap. And as you get out to the more rural areas, you have a progressively increasing cost um, per user as the users are spread out further and further, and your capital investment is amortized over fewer and fewer users. And you eventually get to the situation where if you take, for example, the, uh, the typical cost of connecting up a fixed line user by telephone is $1,000, 1000 US dollars, but you've got somewhere out in the boondocks, and it may cost you $20,000 to connect that chap. The reason it's $1,000 on average is because some of them cost 20000 and most of them cost 800 or 600 or something, or less. Um, but you get, a, you get a, a, a graph that does this, okay? The last few, getting those last few um, consumers or cust customers connected progressively costs more and more. In, in fact, typically, it reaches the point where using a particular technology that you have been using for elsewhere doesn't work. So if someone's out in the boondocks, it doesn't make sense to lay a 50-kilometer telephone wire to him, rather give him a satellite dish. Um, <coughs> in terms of the uh, 5 megabits per second, um, if you are, depends on the technology you're using to provide service to, to service to the consumer, but it may be that it becomes too expensive to provide a, a service at 5 megabits per second to some consumers. However, the other side of the coin is that the, the, the um, authority has collected a significant amount of money, uh, I believe it's about one and a half billion rand, in terms of from the telecommunications operators um, for the Universal Service Access Fund. That money is currently unused. It is currently sitting in Treasury, um, earmarked for use for universal service. Um, uh, people have spoken about using it, for example, for set-top boxes, uh, uh, um, as, but be that as it may, what it's supposed to be used for um, is to, is to um, subsidize the access to uh, communications technologies of those people who are living in underserviced areas. And to that end, the CASA has published or is about to publish a list of all the municipalities, both local and district in the, in the country, ranked in order of how serviced or underserviced they are. Um, and this uh, results from some work done in, in association with USASA. Um, and the next step after that uh, may, or may, not may or may not include building a cost model, but will include, um, I trust, going out to tender for people to provide uh, connectivity to these various areas of various types and see who can do it most efficiently and most effectively, cost effectively. Thank you. I think that's about all we have time-wise. Thanks right. again. Don't forget this and then drop. Thank you. Thank you.